Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Sheila G, the PAC, and this video is all about understanding the difference between seborrheic dermatitis, known as dandruff, and scalp psoriasis. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for all things dermatology content. Let's get into it. So seborrheic dermatitis and localized scalp psoriasis are two conditions that can look very similar and actually have very similar symptoms. So understanding the clinical differences in order to make the correct diagnosis is key when it comes to proper treatment. If you suffer from any condition on the scalp, please see your dermatologist in order to make the correct diagnosis, as there are many skin conditions that can affect the scalp. Let's first talk about seborrheic dermatitis, aka sebderm. Now, sebderm is a chronic condition that can affect the scalp, the ears, the face, sometimes the chest, and even the groin area. However, some people only have the condition on the scalp. Now, sebderm is a condition that involves flaking, itching and inflammation on the skin. It is caused by a normal yeast that already lives on our skin known as malassezia. And it's thought to be due to the fact that when we produce excess oil, um, that yeast may overgrow and trigger a very big inflammatory response, which leads to the development of flaking, um, more so these yellowish greasy flakes on the scalp, um, some redness and irritation. So sebderm more often affects the entire scalp, and when it affects the face, it tends to affect the T-zone, where we produce a lot of oil, as well as the beard area in men. When the condition affects babies in infancy, we refer to it as cradle cap. Now, sebderm can affect all ages, but more commonly affects, again, babies, and between the ages of 30 and 60. So sebderm tends to flare in colder months, and also during times of significant stress. We also see the condition worsening um, the longer you wait to wash the scalp because of that excess oil or sebum production, that yeast just feeds off of that and then the condition gets worse. Now again, this is a chronic condition. There is no cure for it, but we do have many treatment options available to control it. So the best treatments for this condition include anti-dandruff or anti-fungal topical medications, such as your over-the-counter head and shoulders, salsin blue, but we also have prescription um, shampoos as well, such as uh, ketoconazole shampoo. Now when the condition affects the skin itself, such as the face and the ears, um, antifungal cream, such as ketoconazole, may be prescribed, um, as well as low-potency steroid creams to help control the irritation. There are also steroid solutions available for the scalp um, during times of significant irritation and itching. For more severe cases, oral antifungals may be given to temporarily calm down the skin. It also may be recommended to those with um, more severe cases of seborrheic dermatitis to actually wash the scalp more often. Some people have to wash their scalp every single day, and that's okay. Now let's get into scalp psoriasis. I will be making a more in-depth video on psoriasis in the future because it's a lot more complex. Um, but for simplicity, psoriasis is actually an immune-mediated inflammatory condition, which means that it is caused by the immune system basically attacking those skin cells and causing them to overturn a lot faster than normal. So because of that, we see very thick buildup of skin um, and we call them plaques. Now psoriasis is more so a hereditary condition, but just because you have somebody in the family, such as one parent or a sibling that has psoriasis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get it too. Now we tend to see psoriasis more commonly affect those between the ages of 20 and 30, and then again between 50 to 60. Um, now generalized plaque psoriasis tends to affect other areas of the body, more specifically the extensor surfaces, which means the elbows, the knees, um, but in some cases, it may only affect the scalp. Now, the key difference that we see between scalp psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis is that in psoriasis, those scales are very, very thick, and they're actually more silvery in color as opposed to the more yellowish, greasy scale that we see in seborrheic dermatitis. In psoriasis, again, those thick, scaly plaques tend to be on a red base, so it's very what we call briskly inflamed. So when I'm looking at the scalp, I can see um, a very sharp delineation between normal skin and then where the psoriasis starts. So another thing to consider is that psoriasis actually tends to be a lot less itchy than some of your other skin conditions such as eczema or seborrheic dermatitis. But I will say when we're talking about psoriasis on the scalp, that's not always the case. Psoriasis can be very itchy still. 
So psoriasis may very well affect the entire scalp, but more often than not, we tend to see it affect more so the occipital scalp or the posterior scalp. And we can also see it um, behind the ears, kind of tracing up the hairline. So when a patient presents with really thick inflamed plaques on the back of their scalp, but I can't find it anywhere else, more likely than not, it's scalp psoriasis. We also consider the whole picture. Does this patient have other plaques anywhere else on the skin? If so, what do they look like? We consider family history, and then we look at other things such as the nails for any signs of psoriasis where you can get pitting in the nails. Um, and then we also ask about any joint pain, joint aching, because um, for those that have psoriasis, they're a little bit more likely to get um, psoriatic arthritis. So as far as flare-ups, psoriasis may be a constant issue that the patient is dealing with, um, but we may also see worsening flare-ups during times of stress, again. Um, certain medications can flare it, and there's also something known as the Kobner's phenomenon. So the Kobner's phenomenon is kind of a weird thing that's associated with psoriasis, where any trauma to the skin may actually induce a flare-up of psoriasis. So um, an example would be any cut or scrape to the skin. Um, another common thing that I actually see is tattoos. Now again, cold and dry weather may make the condition a little bit worse. And another thing that we tend to see with psoriasis is that if you try to scratch off those big scales or try to remove the scale, you might see some pinpoint bleeding and that's called the auspitz sign, which is something again that is specific to psoriasis. So there are several treatment options available for those suffering with scalp psoriasis. The goal of treatment is to reduce inflammation and to either reduce or eliminate those thick plaques on the scalp. Scalp psoriasis, at least at first, is commonly treated with topical steroid solutions um, in combination with keratolytic medications, um, which are used to break up a lot of those uh, thick plaques and kind of eat up the dead skin cells. Um, an example of that would be like a salicylic acid shampoo. Now, steroid solutions may even be injected into the scalp to help reduce the inflammation. There are oral steroids that may be used, um, but there's also a plethora of other medications that can be used for psoriasis that are non-steroidal. For example, there are some newer topical medications that have unique mechanisms, such as Vitama or Azorith. And then we have Otesla, which is a pill that's indicated for psoriasis. And then ultimately you have biologic medications, which are by far the most effective medications for psoriasis. And those are more um, injectable medications. Not to confuse you too much, but there's actually a condition called SIBO psoriasis, where it's a combination of both conditions. Confusing. But again, these are the main clinical differences that we see between uh, seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff gone wild <laughs> and localized scalp psoriasis. But as always, please see a dermatologist to get the correct diagnosis of your skin condition in order to get the best treatment. So there you have it, a brief overview of the clinical differences that we see between seborrheic dermatitis and localized scalp psoriasis. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment down below. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for all things dermatology content. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.